Lord, we're just so grateful that, um, that you want to be part of our lives, that you want to fill us with your spirit and show us your ways and help us to live as you've called us to live. We thank you, God, that we are never alone in this, that when you call us to something, you always want to equip us and empower us for that. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us, Lord. Amen. 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 Please do take your seats. And let the worship team get near a radiator. If there's any spaces near a radiator, we'll let them, uh, let them warm up. <laughs> so in a moment, um, Richard is going to come and share with us. But before um, he does that, Andy is going to come and give us our first reading, um, which from, is from Acts 9. And really just explains more about Paul, the person who wrote this letter. Acts 9, verses 1 to 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell on the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men, travelling with Saul, stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. Thanks, Andy. And I'm going to invite Richard up now, who's going to come and share with us now. Pray for him before he starts. Yes, Lord, we want to thank you again for your word. We thank you that you're a God who speaks, that you want us to understand what it is you're saying to us. Um, and Lord, we thank you for Richard and the preparation that he has put in um, to preparing this talk for us today, Lord, for the inspiration that you've given him, for the insights you've revealed to him. Lord, I pray that you'd bless him as he shares with us, that he would have clarity in his communication, that he would have confidence in the message that you've given him, and that we would be ready to hear the challenge that you have for us today, Lord. Um, would you speak to us through your word, which is living and active, and we're so grateful for it, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Claire. I have to say, it's not as cold as up here as I I was anticipating. But there again, I was wearing short sleeves yesterday while walking around the city hospital on the outside. That was cold. But there we go. Our second reading is from uh, Colossians chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 24. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, And I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those in Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom all hidden 
in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Amen. May I have my first image up, please? Ooh. Ah, there we go. That is a picture of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. A few years ago, Brenda and I were very fortunate. It was just before, it was 2019, so, you know, a year before lockdown, if you like. We were able to go on for a few days away in Rome in March. And one of the things we did was go to the Vatican. Um, and it is amazing. If you've never been, if you've never been to Rome and you can afford to go, or afford to persuade somebody else to pay for you to go, go to Rome. Go, just wander around. Look at the artwork in the churches. You go into some normal churches and there's Michelangelo's on the wall, unguarded. You know, and it's just bizarre. But anyway, we go to St. Peter's Basilica. We go around the Vatican. We go in there first. Long queues, but we paid in advance, so we queue jumped. And we get in, and you're wandering around, and it is just gobsmacking. You know, it's one of those places. And on our way round, there was this sign for a side chapel that said, for prayer only. And you can't take photos. That's fine, because everywhere else it's click, 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 as you can see. And we go into this little side chapel, and we decide to go and pray, so we go in, and it is gold everywhere along the front. There's the smell of, I think, the beautiful smell of incense, because I love incense, and it was just, but what blew me away was not the sight of the gold or the smell of the incense or the reserved sacrament in the, in the little boxes, but it was just kneeling down there in a place that thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people have prayed in every day for about four or five hundred years or whatever, however old the St. Peter's Basilica is. And I'm knelt there just feeling the overwhelming sense of the presence of God in that place. It was as if the old Graham Kendrick song, you know, the fragrance of Jesus rested in that place. And it's way outside my normal comfort zone, that sort of thing. It's the way outside my churchmanship. But you could have cut the, the, the atmosphere with a, a knife because, if you like, because Jesus was just present there. Those people had prayed, people had prayed there for hundreds of years, thousands had prayed there. Is it any wonder the presence of Jesus was just resting in that place? And then you go from St. Peter's Basilica into the Vatican Museum. So if I could have my next picture up, please. And walking around the Vatican Museum and art galleries, there are, well, the crowds were just unbelievable. Thousands upon thousands of people, you're sort of walking along like this. It, and there's so many bits of artwork. There's so many different pieces of um, pottery, gold, pieces of art on the walls, pieces of art over doorways, on ceilings, you know. It's just overwhelming the amount of art that is there. But as we're walking around, there is this one picture just on a wall, not particularly well positioned. It was just there. And it just caught my eye immediately. And it was just, and that's it. it it's, um, I'll tell you who it's by. It's, um, I can't even see who it is now. Oh, it is Gerardo de Torre. I've never heard of him. 1927 crucifixion is what it's called. He was a futurist artist. If you want to know what a futurist artist is, use Google. Because that, that's the only reason I found out he was a futurist artist, because I had no idea who he was. But what struck me about this picture, and what still strikes me every time I look at my photographs of that holiday, is the light. 
you've got the light shining down on the cross. And the way the light just comes down from heaven and, and spotlights Jesus there on the cross with his arms raised. And at the bottom, you've got the two women in tears looking up and in adoration at Jesus. And then you have the light coming out of his hands going back up to heaven, spotlighting the Father. And you've got this light going both ways, and it is that light of Christ, the light of God, the glory of God just breaking through at the crucifixion. And it's there on the cross. And in the Vatican, at Outside my normal experience, my normal way of being, and we're going to leave that up throughout the whole, uh, whole talk, just so you know. Um, there was the two things profoundly spoke to me of the glory and majesty of God. The glory of God, the glory of Christ, the fragrance of Jesus, the light of the world, whatever metaphor we want to say, care. There was that moment in a side chapel and then there was this moment before a picture that thousands upon thousands of people will have walked past that day and not really noticed. Others will have just stopped like I did and seen the light the Jesus spotlighted there on the cross. And as we spend a few minutes now looking at this passage from Colossians, I want us to hold that image of Jesus being spotlighted the glory of God being revealed on a cross before our, our minds. So the picture will stay there, but it's the whole image of the glory of God being sp spotlighted. As we know from previous weeks, in Colossians... There was an issue with some false teaching going around. It's thought that it might have been around the concept of having mysteries to be revealed, deeper mysteries that you needed to be revealed. Things that could only be revealed to initiates who were going further into the faith. Things that were only could be revealed in um, what are known as mystery religions, needed special knowledge, special initiation rites. One of the very popular gods of the time was um, of a mystery god where you had to be specially initiated into the mystery of the god was Mithras. Have you all heard of Mithras? Good. I've got some nods. Myth but if you go up to Hadrian's Wall, there's actually a temple to Mithras. Um, but he was one of the mystery gods of the, of the time, a Persian god. And to be initiated, you had to go through some special rites. And what Port would have the... Re reasons Paul writes Colossians is to argue against that. He says the mysteries, and we keep getting this in this passage, the mysteries of God have been fully revealed in Jesus. Revealed from all times, fully revealed in Jesus. You don't need more. It's Jesus. That's the mystery. It's Jesus, fully revealed in Jesus. And to do that, he, he uses the Christ hymn that Claire preached on last week. Um, I didn't hear that sermon. I did think about watching it online, but I'm sorry I didn't. Naughty boy. I was preaching elsewhere, so I didn't get a chance to hear. But I still think this passage is relevant not only to when it was written 2,000 years ago to the church in Colossae because people were saying, oh, there's these mysteries, these extra things you need to know, extra things that need to be revealed, things that could seductively lead people down the wrong path. But it's so often the case over the past 2,000 years that churches have been led down the wrong path by extra teachings, by special teachings, by things that get revealed. Hello, you're coming up to see me? Yeah, it's up to you. Anyway, sorry, I, I, I get distracted easily. Um, so people get on their hobby horses and teach about things from anything, whatever it is the latest thing. A few years ago it was... Um, End Times, I don't know whether that's still popular, things like the, the NAF books, what are those Life Behind series of books and things like that, they're just awful. Anyway, but people use those things as seductively take us down the wrong path. And Paul, Paul says, well, I work hard, I work hard so that you don't have to go down those wrong paths. I work hard, and he keeps saying it, I work hard. Paul states three times in this section He's working hard. And when something is repeated time and time again in a Bible passage, it means that 
he's stressing it, isn't he? It means maybe it's something we should pay attention to. He keeps saying it in different ways, different times. If you think about it, this is a letter written to a church and you would have probably not had it, well, you wouldn't have had it done like this. This is a very weird way of reading a letter, reading out bits of it and then talking about those bits for 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Really, the church would have sat down and just read the letter. Here's the latest letter from Paul and read it. Then they might have discussed it a bit. But if you think about it, when they're reading that letter, if you're here, well, I'm working hard for you, I'm working hard for you, I'm contending for you. Actually, three times, so that emphasis, when you first hear that and you first hear it three times, you might miss it the first time, but you're not going to miss it all three times. He says, I'm suffering in verse 24, in 29. I strenuously contend in verse 1 of the next chapter as we have it. How hard I am contending for you. But we need to make a comment on that first one, the verse 24, because um, it's a bit weird, isn't it? Are you allowed to say the Bible's weird? I think it is at times. It's also boring at times. Do you not find it boring at times? Anyway, sorry. I'll never get us back. I now, rejoice in, I now rejoice in what I am suffering for you. Ah, he rejoices in suffering. And I am filled up with the flesh what is still lacking in regard for Christ's afflictions. It sounds as if Paul is suffering because Christ didn't suffer enough. And that's just, surely Christ suffered enough on the cross. Surely Christ suffered enough when he was flogged, let alone get on the cross. But what Paul is talking about, and what most of the commentators I read this week trying to understand that bit, suggest is um, Paul is indicating and suggesting that when he suffers, when Paul suffers for the gospel, when Paul suffers for the Colossians, when Paul suffers for the Laodiceans or the Philippians, when Paul suffers, Christ suffers alongside of him. So if a Christian is suffering, It is as if Christ is suffering because Christ is with us. Jesus is with us in our walk, our everyday walk. So whatever you are going through at the moment, if you're going through a period of great joy and fun, Christ's with you in that and celebrating. If you're going through the depths of despair and pain and sickness, Jesus is with you, suffering alongside you. I mean, even at the end of Matthew's Gospel, he says, Lo, I am with... Lo. Shows what I learned here from the RSV. Lo, I am with you to the, to the end of the age. Lo, I am with you. One of the things I love about that passage at, at, at the end of Matthew is, I am with you, always with you, to the very end of time. Jesus is with us in the good stuff and the bad stuff. When we're rejoicing and when we're mourning and when we're suffering, Jesus suffers alongside of us. Uh, The reason I read, we got, uh, um, I asked for chapter 9 of Acts to be read is because it speaks of Paul's conversion. And there at Paul's conversion, we have this thing where Paul hears this voice from heaven sees the light and hears a voice. And Paul says, who are you? And the voice says, I am the Lord who you are persecuting. I am Jesus who you are persecuting. Paul wasn't persecuting Jesus. Jesus had ascended by then. Paul was persecuting the church. And that's as if he was persecuting Jesus. So when you're going through sufferings, when you're getting persecuted, we don't get persecution in this country, by the way. No matter what, what the press say, we are not persecuted. Persecuted is when you're locked up or you can't come through those doors because you're a Christian. Persecuted is when you're beaten and put in prison for your faith. We just might get a bit of ribbing and mocking in the, the press. That's all. In comparison to others. But when you're persecuted for your faith, Jesus is being persecuted with you. But why is Paul suffering persecution? Why is Paul contending so hard? Why is he striving for the, for the gospel? And so he answers that three times. If he said it three times, he'll answer it three times. And what, oh gosh, 
I'm going on. Sorry, I need to cut this down a bit, I think. He says, so that, in verse 28, so that we may be fully present, present you fully mature in Christ. He wants people to grow in faith. Verse, he says, so that you may be encouraged and riches of complete understanding of Christ. He desperately wants these new followers to grow in maturity so that you are not deceived. He wants to ensure that they are not deceived by false teachings that are flying around. Paul wants these new Christians to grow in faith. He has a great desire to see that this fledgling church there in Colossae grows and matures in its understanding of faith and its Knowledge of Jesus and its relationship with Jesus. The whole of this passage, in fact you could say the whole of Colossians, is about that spotlight on Christ. That spotlight on Jesus. It's about revealing who Jesus is and saying you need to get to know Jesus better. Because then you will have that hope of glory within you. At which point, does anyone else want to sing the Graham Kendrick song when you read that verse? Do you know it? Rejoice, rejoice, Christ is in you, the hope of glory in our lives. Sorry, just all the way through preparing this, I kept singing it in my head. I had to go downstairs and say to Peter, what's that song with? And sing the line at her. But it's about shining the spotlight on Jesus so that the fullness of God may be known, verse 25, verse 27, so that the mysteries may be known, because the mystery is Jesus, who has been fully revealed. Verse 28, maturity in Christ. Verse 29, the energy of Christ. Verse 2 of the next chapter, mystery of God, namely Christ. So that you might be firm in your faith in Christ. This passage and many others in Colossians is about shining the spotlight on Jesus. Just as the Tory does in that image. Paul focuses on Christ. And when I use the term Christ, it is the Greek title that is used in the New Testament. If I was speaking Hebrew, I would use Messiah. And if I use English, it's anointed one. So that's all it means. The focus of Paul is that as followers of Jesus our focus and our spotlight has to be Jesus. We need to make sure that we know Jesus. I've been minister of three churches. Um, not all of them have had Ignites and Sunday clubs or whatever, junior church, Sunday school, whatever the latest trendy term is, to, to, for the kids to go out to. But the first one did, and every week they would go out. And every week I would do as Claire did this morning, and pray for them. Brilliant, that's what we need to do. And my prayer would be something along the lines of pray that they get to know about Jesus more or get to know the Bible better and that we who are in church get to know Jesus, about Jesus more. And I suddenly realised after about five or six years of praying similar prayers to that, that maybe it's not getting to know, knowledge about Jesus is great, but surely what we should be praying is that they get to know Jesus, not just about Jesus but know Jesus. What do I want for my sermon is that you get to know, have more knowledge. That's great. But surely it's about that encounter with Jesus, which is much more important through the preaching, through the teaching. Getting to know Jesus. When you want to get to know somebody, do you just exchange CVs? When I was started dating Brenda many, many, many years ago, we didn't just exchange CVs to find out about each other to make a decision on whether to get married. We spent time together to get to know each other. And then we spent another, we've spent another 30 odd years to get, get, actually getting to know each other. But it's about spending time together. Spending time together learn, to get to know each other. If you want to become a friend of somebody, you don't just do it by text and say, Oh, can I be your friend? No, no, you spend time together. You get to know a person. If we want to know Jesus, we need to spend time with Jesus. If we want to have the hope of glory in our lives fully and become fully mature in, in Christ, we need to get to know Jesus. We can do that through, through Bible study, yes, but that's a lot more head knowledge. We need to know 
know him in our relationship sense. We need to spend time with Jesus. And everybody spends time with Jesus in different ways. We all get to know Jesus in different ways. Some of us will do it through study. I, I love Bible study. I love um, the sort of geeky stuff. I, used, I loved spending three years sitting in a library as a student reading theology books. That was, oh, that was just bliss. But for others, that would be as boring as it comes. And I get that. What is it that helps you spend time with Jesus? What is it that helps you develop your friendship, your relationship with Jesus? For some of us, it would be going along to things that are extended periods of sung worship. And that is a great way of getting to spending time with Jesus in Jesus' presence. For others, it will be going to a little side chapel in the Vatican. And dwelling in the presence of Jesus. For others, it will be going on a pilgrimage walk through the hills or the Camino de Santiago de Compostela or whatever it is that floats your boat. For others, it will be gazing at a piece of art for hours and going, Jesus has been highlighted on the cross. For others, it will be listening to a piece of music where we can sense the presence of God. What is it that helps you get to know Jesus? Not just about Jesus. We need to know about Jesus. Yes, I'm all for that. I'm all for growing in our our knowledge and how it all fits together and how the Old Testament feeds into the New and all that jazz and what was going on in Colossae at the beginning when this letter was written because it wasn't written in isolation. I want us to know that. But more and more importantly is know the person of Jesus. Grow in relationship with Jesus. How is it that you can do that? What is it that works for you? Yesterday I was working at the hospital as a a, a chaplain and we needed to take some communions out um, because there was only one chaplain on this morning and it would be too many to do today. So my colleague who who was there with me was going to do that because he likes doing that, doing bedside communions. But what happened was he came to me and said, Richard, we've only got four wafers, which fell wafers are already intincted with the wine um, that we have to use. And he said, I need to do some more. Do you mind if we have a communion service? It'll only take 15 minutes. Um, because he's an Anglican, we have to do it by the book. I said, well, if you want to spend 15 minutes doing communion, you can, and I'll come and join you, and it would be fantastic. Or if you don't mind, I'll go and do it in a Baptist way, which is get a bit of a a dripper and go bing, 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 and put it in a cupboard. Um, Because to me, communion is only communion when it's actually been served. But he said, no, I'd like to do do it the way I do it. And I said, that's great. Fantastic, I loved it. So we sat in the hospital chapel yesterday morning at um, about 9.30, having communion, just the two of us. A boy was Jesus present. It was just a beautiful moment. It felt a bit rushed when he rushed through the words at times. But I always think we meet Jesus in the bread and wine I love the fact that in some church traditions they take communion every single Sunday. I love that. I get get that because I always meet Jesus at communion. And I think it's important. So whatever way, piece of art, music, song, song worship, going for a walk in the hills, taking communion, what is it? that helps you meet with Jesus. We need to incorporate that because we could say, oh, it's coming to church on Sunday, but coming to church on Sunday is only an hour. I was going to say an hour, but it's going to be nearer an hour and a half, isn't it? An hour and a half of your week. What do you do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? What do you do to meet with Jesus in the everyday There's a book called Practicing the Presence of Christ, and that's what we need to do. Practice the presence of Christ in the everyday. When you're washing up, when you're walking the dog, 
when you're taking the kids to school, when you're cooking the meal, what is it that helps you meet with Jesus? Because that is when we get to know Jesus more. It is then that we will mature as followers of Jesus. It is then that we will have that hope of glory in our lives. Amen.